Good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Iowa City Public Library and our program this afternoon. My name is Kara Logston. I'm the Community Services Coordinator at Iowa City Public Library. And I have to tell you, I'm very excited about this program because I grew up in the Iowa City area and every year the Highlanders would come to my school and do a, uh, you know, a dance and they would teach us, they would let us kind of you know, see the bagpipes and the drums and um, it was something that we always looked forward to. And so growing up in Iowa City, the Scottish Highlanders were a big part of our community and so it's wonderful that we can take a step back and learn more about the history of the Scottish Highlanders. Uh, just a couple little um, housekeeping things. We are live on the library channel, which is cable channel 10, um, Mediacom in Iowa City. We will replay the program on the library channel. We will also stream the program through the library's video stream. So if you have a computer with high speed internet access, you're able to watch the program that way too. So if you have questions about when the programs will play or how to get to the video stream, please call the library and we can help you out with that. So on to our program, we have two speakers today. Uh, Dick Federson or Richard Federson is a retired colonel of the infantry of the US Army. He's also a lifelong resident of Iowa City and he was one of the eight young men recruited from City High School uh, to be a part of the, the original Scottish Highlanders. So we're delighted that he's with us today. And then Heather Adamson Stockman is our second speaker. Um, she's also a lifelong resident of Iowa City. She's the daughter of Bill Adamson, who's the original director of the Scottish Highlanders. And she's also been very active in coordinating um, the display that was out at um, the Johnson County Historical Society, the display that's upstairs, and also the wonderful new display that's out at the Iowa Hall of Fame. And so if you haven't been out to see that exhibit, it's my understanding that they don't charge admission to that facility anymore, and so I would encourage you to go see that display too. It's wonderful. Um, she's a member of the steering committee for the Scottish Highlander Historical Preservation Projects and lots of other things to do with the Highlanders. And I know there's probably a picture of her somewhere here dancing on a drum. So make sure you see that picture before you go. So I'll turn the program over to our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kara, and thanks to everybody for coming here today. Uh, what we plan to do is that I'm going to talk a little bit about the early days and the first eight people that were recruited out of Iowa City High School in 1936 into the State University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders. And I'll talk a little bit about those early days and then the main speaker that you're going to hear from today is Heather because uh, she is going to talk about and pick it up where I left off and give you some history of the background of why the Scottish Highlanders ever came to Iowa City in the first place. The time was 1936. Roosevelt had just defeated Alf Landon, and we were in the depths of the Depression. They rang the bell, and everybody at the old Iowa City High School <clears throat> on, uh, uh, across from, uh, in Market Square, across from Mercy Hospital, everybody was to go to the uh, assembly room the study hall because there was going to be a program and uh, we all went to the study hall and of course the old Iowa City High School was totally inadequate we were sitting two people to a seat sitting in the aisles and a number of the people were sitting in the window sills and uh, we got in there we got all located and then got, everybody got quieted down and in came Pipe Major Bill Adamson, a drummer and another piper, and Colonel George Daly. And it was very impressive. Colonel Daly was an infantry colonel and he was the professor of military science and tactics at the State University of Iowa and he had decided he wanted a bagpipe band to play for the ROTC program and the ROTC cadets 
and for all the activities that they were involved in. And he came there, and when Bill Adamson, Heather's father, played the bagpipes, everybody's jaws just dropped. Now, bear in mind, folks, people were not as sophisticated then as they were today. None of us had ever even heard bagpipes before. And what was the pitch from Colonel Daly? The pitch was, join the State University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders your junior year in high school. By the time you graduate, you'll be a piper or a drummer. Commit yourself to go to the State University of Iowa. Commit yourself to take advanced reserve officers training in the four-year course, and you'll join the Highlanders and see the world. Well, we didn't see the world like the girls did, but we did see a lot of the United States, and we had a wonderful time, and we developed a lot of wonderful relationships. We did travel quite a bit, as, as, as Heather will tell you later on. We uh, played at uh, football games and things like that, but we really weren't appreciated very much in Iowa City because when we played at football games, people didn't go there to hear the Scottish Howlers. They went there to see the Hawks play football. And uh, so we didn't make it much of an impression, I don't think, in those early days uh, upon any of the people that were in the audience. But when we went to Kansas City, that was one of the, one of the early trips that we took. We went to the Kansas City Auditorium and we started a half a block away and they were having the national band concerts there and we were especially act. We started a half a block away and they could hear us coming and when we got near the auditorium they threw open the doors and we came in there playing Scotland the Brave and Highland Laddie. Then we switched to the slow march Lord Love and Lament and we went out and the crowd just went nuts. They'd never seen anything like it. They were on their feet and they were bringing us back and it was embarrassing. We put, we put uh, uh, Heather Adamson's, uh, uh, Fran Adamson, Heather's mother on, on top of the drum head and four guys held her up there and she did the Highland Fling on top of the drum head and I played the Highland Fling along with four other people and she danced on the drum head and they kept bringing us back and bringing us back. It was kind of embarrassing because we stole the show. So we did have our moments. We went to the New York World's Fair, played in the Scotch Village, stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, went to the Cotton Club. Uh, Bill Adamson and Colonel Daly arranged for all these wonderful accommodations and entertainment for us, for which we were uh, tremendously grateful. And uh, a funny thing happened when we were playing in, this is 1939. Funny thing happened when we were playing in the Scotch Village at about 8 o'clock at night. And uh, Heather's mother was dancing on the drum head, and I'm playing the Highland Fling with two other guys. There was an old boy sitting not very far from me. And this old guy had had a few, uh, a few drinks, and he had a cane, and he turned the cane upside down, and he hooked it under my kilt, and he pulled it clear up. <laughs> And I couldn't, I had to keep playing, and so I had to get away from him. I got away from him, I got off far enough away that he couldn't uh, annoy me anymore. <laughs> and uh, when it was over with, I went up and I said, what do you think you were doing there? Well, he said, I just wanted to see what you had underneath the kilt. <laughs> uh, we had to put up with a lot of that nonsense, but it, it was fun. It was just marvelous. And, and the accommod as I said, the accommodations and, and, and Bill Adamson and Colonel Daly were, were so kind and so thoughtful about arranging everything for us. Well, uh, after I graduated, I went to the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia as a second lieutenant with Ben Summerwell and Bob Cadgen and a bunch of other guys from the ROTC program here. And when we got down there with the a, with a United States military class, of uh, 1941, that's when we graduated, when they, were, when, when they graduated. Why, uh, I was lying in the barracks one night and I heard somebody playing the pipes. And I jumped in the car and I drove over there and there was a guy 
from the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders who had just graduated from the British Military Academy, Sandhurst. And they had sent their infantry people to the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia to learn infantry tactics our way. And this guy's playing the pipes and he's marching up and down and it was a temperature was about 90 degrees in the barracks and he was bare to the waist up, wearing his kilts, playing the pipes. And when he got all done, I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and he comes over and he says, what'd you think of that? And I said, well, that's pretty interesting. And he, I said, well, um, I heard this music and I just had to come over and see what it was. Well, he said, these are the bagpipes, and they're very difficult to play. This is the chanter, this is the bass drone, these are the two tenor drones. And I said, could I try it? And he said, no, Yank. He says, you don't want to try it. He says, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult instrument. Well, he said, I said, just let me try it. So he took the ch chanter and grabbed the bass drone, and handed it to me. I took it, put it up, started out with Scotland the Brave, Played Highland Laddie, uh, finished up with the Black Watch marching song, the 42nd, and uh, took the pipes and handed them back to him. And he says, well, so you play the pipes. <laughs> and I said, yes. He says, are you of Scottish descent? And I said, no, all my relatives came over here on a German passport. And he said, oh my God, an American kraut playing the pipes. <laughs> Today you would say only in America, only in America. Okay, well, I'm, I don't want to talk too long because you're, you're gonna to want to hear from Heather here and she's got the main part of this program and the most interesting part. But I want to tell you about some of the guys that were in there with me. And this was a people organization run by two wonderful people, Colonel Daly and the great administrator and the great pipe master, Bill Adamson. And <coughs> the, one of the ones I want to talk about here is uh, Bill Murden. Bill Murden was a lawyer here in town. I grew up with him. He used to went to junior high school and high school with him, was in the same fraternity he was in in college. He was just like a brother to me. And Bill Mirden, I thought, was the best cadet piper that we had. Now, nobody could ever touch Bill Adamson, but uh, Bill, I think, was better than any of the rest of us. I know you'd be shocked to know that I wasn't the best, but I wasn't the best. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, Bill Mirden was really good, and he ha had been a... Uh, clarinet player, and clarinet players usually make pretty good uh, bagpipers. Uh, what happened to Bill Mirden? Well, I went to the South Pacific, and I was on five amphibious assault operations, and on the fourth one in, in amphibious assault in the Zamboanga, Mindanao, Mindanao, Philippine Islands. Things got terribly confused. We went in on the first wave with my rifle company. I was a rifle company combat team commander. And we didn't land where we were supposed to, and we landed uh, at a place where there was a bunch of anti-aircraft guns that the uh, Navy had knocked out. And uh, so I noted that. And I got out, and I, I didn't know where we were, but I had aerial photographs in my hand that were taken by the Navy pilot Bill Mirden. I found that out after the war. Bill Mirden took those pictures. And I was able to identify, identify the objective and, and get myself oriented. Uh, Bill, Bill said that he saw those anti-aircraft guns there and that one of them shot the cupola, the, 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 uh, the glass bubble off of the top of the plane. And Pertner took his head along with it. And so these strange things happen. The bagpipe is a military instrument and it's taken into war. And on the aircraft carrier that Bill Mirden was on, he would play Scotland the Brave when the planes took off. The captain of the aircraft carrier 
brought him up to the bridge. He played over the loudspeaker. The planes took off. Bill put his pipes down, got in his plane, and he took off. He was Navy pilot photographer. That's, that's Bill Mearden. Max Showers, his picture's over there. He's uh, over, over there right now, and you want to take a look at it. There's a, my picture, and, and Dr. Charles Gray, and Max Showers is the third guy from the left. Max Showers was, is, is a <coughs> rear admiral in the United States regular Navy, and he was one of the guys that broke the Japanese naval code. He's got, he was a bagpiper and a good one, and he was uh, uh, one, of, one of the people that was probably more instrumental in helping to win the Pacific War than anyone else I ever knew help break the Japanese Naval Code. He's got every distinguished service decoration that the Navy can give you. Okay. There was a guy by the name of Bill Millen who was in the uh, Lord Lovett's uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Lord Lovett's battalion of Scottish Highlanders that landed on Sword Beach in the invasion of Normandy, in the, in the big Allied invasion. And Bill Millen was a Scotsman from Scotland, of course, and a corporal and a bagpiper. And Lord Lovett, before they went into Sword Beach on the LCVPs, on the, on the Higgins boats, in the first wave, he put Bill Millen, Millen up in the front of the bow of one of the boats, and he played the pipes, Scotland the Brave, into the beach. And when he got on the beach, by the way, bandsmen in their army and ours become stretcher bearers and aid men when they aren't playing their instruments. And after he played the pipes and brought them into the beach, he put his pipes down and went over and was administering to the wounded. And the Germans did something that is absolutely unforgivable. They sent a mortar round over and blew up the bagpipes. And <laughs> I thought that that was a sad end to Bill Mellon's bagpipe, but he survived. He, sur he, su he survived the thing. Well, as I said, we were a military band. We played for Governor's Day. We played whenever the military uh, had a, a parade at the State University of Iowa with the ROTC cadets, and we played at the United States uh, military Academy at West Point. And I think the proudest day of the old grads, Colonel George Daly, I think one of the proudest days of his life when he took his State University of Iowa Highlanders to the United States Military Academy and we played the Corps of Cadets onto the field. That was a very proud day for Colonel Daly. So those were all things that those were all things that happened. Well, I've I've talked enough, so I'm going to I'm going to end this thing. Heather's going to come up and talk to you, and I want to say this before I leave. I think that the greatest story of all is the story that happened after we left and went off to war, and the girls took over. I think they did a marvelous job, and I think they were the greatest diplomatic exchange that the United States government ever sent to Europe or to France or to all those countries that they visited. Uh, Heather will tell you about this, Scotland, G Germany, all the rest, Switzerland, since Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin is the guy that brought the money and the French end to the Revolutionary War that helped us win the Revolutionary War. Heather will tell you what the, what the girls did, and I think it's greater than anything that we ever did. I think the, uh, the hat's off to the girls' Highlanders. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dick. That was a inspiring story you have to tell about your experiences with the Scottish Highlanders. I'm going to back up just a little bit and tell you some of the basic history of the group. 
um, and how my father became involved and kind of the inspiration behind this, the group. Um, born in 1907 in Boston, Massachusetts of Scottish immigrants, Bill Adamson was raised with Scottish traditions. John Adamson was Bill's father and he left his home in Dunfermline, Scotland in 1884, bound for the United States of America. Early on, John Adamson worked in the coal mines in the Kansas Territory. He had various other jobs before becoming a bagpipe maker and importer of Scottish items. He finally settled in Boston, Massachusetts, and was the only bagpipe maker in the United States. Young Bill was, after a bout with infantile paralysis, was left with a weakened left arm. So at the age of nine, on the doctor's recommendation, his father decided that he should learn to play the bagpipes to help strengthen that arm. But soon Bill became proficient, and in his young adult years, he taught bagpiping and performed in several of the local bagpipe bands in Boston. He also then competed in Scottish Highland dancing as well as bagpiping, winning several awards for his skills. In 1935, he won first honors in piping and second in Scottish dancing at an international competition. Bill had always dreamed of someday having his own bagpipe band. An answer to these prayers came in 1936 when Colonel George Daly at the State University of Iowa envisioned a bagpipe band to accompany their military corps. As Dick has told you, Bill was recruited by Colonel Daly to lead the group at Iowa, which at the time was under the ROTC department. And this was the birth of the University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders as an all-male bagpipe band. In 1937, Bill and his very pregnant wife, Fran, moved way out west to Iowa City, Iowa, leaving their home and families in Boston. By that time, Colonel Daly had recruited eight students from local high school to learn to play the bagpipes. He had enticed them by providing the training and uniforms for the boys as part of their ROTC commitment. While Bill worked with these boys, he recruited additional college men, and the group soon grew to 30 marching members. By the fall football season of 1937, the first performance of the State University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders was presented at University Stadium, beginning their long football game day tradition. In 1939, this was a banner year for the State University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders. In June of that year, 40 members tra traveled to New York City to perform in the World's Fair. Because they were such a hit, they were asked to do two extra performances for the cheering crowds. A highlight of each performance was when six sturdy members hoisted a large bass drum upon their shoulders as a platform for one of the women dancers to perform the, the drum dance. This was done by my mother, as Dick has explained. And the drum dance was actually originated by my father. While in New York City, the Highlanders were guests of CBS and were shown through their studios in the Guy Lombardo and his orchestra broadcast on their regular Monday night venue. The group remained all male and increased in numbers until World War II. Six years later, in 1943, when 71 of the 75 male members were called to serve their country in the war, the decision was made to transition the group to all female. This change was overwhelmingly received and the ranks continued to grow through the years. The group soon became the world's largest all-female bagpipe band. 
The selection criteria for membership in the Scottish Highlanders ref reflected Bill Adamson's expectations and philosophy. He carefully chose young women who came from good American homes. They exemplified good citizens with high moral standards and conduct. He said, we've skimmed off the top layer of the cream of American youth to select the Highlanders. They come from fine American homes and are the best girls in the world. With that kind of talent, how could we go wrong? The Highlanders were kept in line by their governing committee of seven elected members among their, for their own representatives. Under the direction of Bill Adamson, the co-eds were required to maintain high standards of social conduct. Appropriate, uh, appropriate attire was mandated at all times. When traveling, if someone wanted to go out for an afternoon or evening excursion, the girl had to be accompanied by at least two other members. This required a logbook to be kept at the hotel front desk. So you, we had to sign out when we left, identifying the time, who we went with, and then sign in upon our return. Bed check was conducted every night by the governing committee. And any punishment for abuse of any of the rules was also determined and carried out by the governing committee. The strict rules that governed this group fostered the development of mutual respect for their devoted leader, Bill Adamson, and he for them. In 1947, a group of 47 members traveled west to the Lions International Convention in San Francisco. There they were awarded first prize in competition against delegations from 18 foreign countries and every state in the United States. In 1948, an Eastern trip took 32 members to New York City to perform in Madison Square Garden and assist with political campaigns. By the 1950s, tryouts for memberships in the Scottish Highlanders had grown enormously. Many young girls searching for a college chose to attend the University of Iowa because of their desire and possibility of becoming a member of this famous group. Soon membership had to be limited. At one time, 500 young men attended tryouts in hopes of being selected for one of the only 35 openings. It had truly become a select and prestigious, prestigious affiliation. The Scottish Highlanders played an important part in the war bond effort in the 1950s. They served as living symbols of the slogan at that time, which was Thrift for Security, Savings Bond Drive. They performed in nearly every county in Iowa, helping earn over $30 million in E and H saving bonds for the United States Treasury. Iowa exceeded their expected goals. This press release was issued. The Treasury Department of the United States awarded Iowa permanent possession of the Minuteman Trophy. Iowa topped the 12 major states in Group 1 in increase of bond sales for the fiscal year of 1953 with a 46% increase over sales of the preceding year. Group one for this drive includes Michigan, Wisconsin, Texas, Illinois, California, Missouri, Indiana, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. And Iowa exceeded them all. The Scottish Highlanders' first foreign travel was in 1952. 59 members spent more than a month together traveling through seven countries. Unfortunately, in anticipation of their visit to the city of Aberdeen, Scotland, one civic leader in Aberdeen criticized the group 
and describe them as comic characters who make a mockery of Scotland's national instrument and dress. However, after the group's performance before a crowd of 23,000 that evening, the people of Aberdeen warmed and welcomed them with open hearts. Upon their return to Iowa, the Scottish Highlanders received a silver mace, that's the baton that the drum major carries, bearing the description, to commemorate the happy memories left in Aberdeen on August 13 and 14, 1952. This was truly an expression of the spirit of goodwill fostered by the traveling Iowans and their Scottish people. Their three weeks of performing in the British Isles resulted in more than $11,000 being raised for British charities, an impressive monetary amount for 1952. Bill Adamson was awarded the Lord, Lord Elgin Award for being named the Outstanding Scot of 1952 by the Illinois St. Andrews Society. This 1952 maiden voyage to Europe began the tradition for the Scottish Highlanders that they were to repeat every four years until 1976. During the following years in the 50s, the Scottish Highlanders are frequently called upon to perform at a variety of engagements such as civic festivals and athletic events which had very little military connection or, to, or connection to the ROTC department. So in 1955, the group was transferred within the university to become part of the Iowa Memorial Union, which was the social and cultural center of the university. In 1956, their European tour, tour encompassed 10 weeks and seven countries. Beginning with performances in Washington, D.C. and New York City, the 72-member group boarded the Queen Mary for their sea voyage to the European continent. They toured France, Holland, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, before going on to Great Britain, where they performed before welcoming crowds. In the Scottish cities of Elgin and Aberdeen, the girls stayed with local families, forming lifelong friendships in many cases. In 1957 and 1959, the Rose Bowl trips were made with the Scottish, the, between the Scottish Highlanders and the State University of Iowa Hawkeye Marching Band to support the Iowa Hawkeyes and their football team. These trips were memorable experiences for the co-eds as they traveled by train to California, performing in various cities along the route. In California, they marched in the Tournament of Roses Parade and performed at Disneyland and, of course, at the Rose Bowl football games. The 1960 European trip had many highlights. In Washington, D.C., the group was met by Congressman Fred Schwingel, who arranged for a tour of the White House. Senator Hickenlooper introduced the Scottish Highlanders from the floor of the Senate during their usual meeting. The girls had an interview with Vice President Nixon, whom they found warm and personable. The girl the, in New York City, the University of Iowa President Virgil Hancher, joined them at their banquet and performances for the New York Alumni Group. Then they boarded the ship, the Queen Elizabeth, for their journey across the ocean to Europe and the British Isles. In London, the newspapers had dropped their previous snide comments and referred to them as typical American girls, just exactly the billing that they wanted. The local sponsors could not accommodate the crowds and the girls who fell in love with the Scottish people and the Scottish people fell in love with them. Paris was an education for the girls. There they were exposed to the indifferences of the French people as well as the grandeur of France itself. Amsterdam displayed its considerate and polite people Germany showed their ultimate rebuilding in a short time, as well as its prosperity. Rome was filled with history. Bern, Switzerland was the final stopping place, as they were welcomed into a luxury hotel. 
In summary, the girls' education was enhanced and broadened. Their desire to learn more history, geography, and languages was stimulated. Public relations were much improved over the 1952 trip. It seemed that the countries realized that the Scottish Highlanders were not there to, co to compete with them, but merely to foster relations of goodwill between the nations. In 1964, the European trip began with a performance in Washington, D.C., and then to New York City, where they performed in the World's Fair. The 77 women students of the Scottish Highlanders gave performances in the British Isles. Cities included were London, Edinburgh, Dunfermline, Elgin, and Dunbar, with all the proceeds, again, going to British charities, as has always been their tradition. They then traveled to the continent to tour the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, Italy, France, and Switzerland. They returned home to the States with the wonderful eight-week experience spreading goodwill to all the countries that they visited. Even though plagued with years of chronic illness of rheumatoid arthritis, Bill Adamson continued to direct the Highlanders, his true passion. In December of 1965, he passed away from disease complications at the young age of 58. The Scottish Highlanders continued their scheduled performances under the director and leadership of their student assistant director, John Stewart. Beginning in 1966, the Scottish Highlanders were led by various graduate students attending the university part-time for their advanced degrees. A full-time director was never hired again. The continuity instruction and philosophy were difficult to maintain under short-term direction with divided attention to their studies. In 1968, the European trip of the University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders marked their fifth tour of the, of the British Isles and the European continent. Their adventures took them to six countries and England and Scotland. With their new director, Al McIver, the 74 co-eds left Iowa City on June 28th and returned on August 23rd. First, they toured the countries of Germany, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, France, and the Netherlands. The month of August was devoted to sightseeing and performances in the British Isles and Ireland. One memorable highlight was attending the famous tattoo in Edinburgh, Scotland. They were guests of several city councils and were honored at many receptions. Warm welcomes greeted them as they stayed in the homes of local Scottish families and learned the culture and traditions firsthand. Once again, the trip was a wonderful experience and the, with many educational opportunities in history, art, music, architecture, foreign language, and sociology. In 1972, the Highlanders made another journey to foreign lands during their six-week tour, they saw seven countries. For two weeks, they spent in the British Isles. They had several performances before welcoming audiences. Battersea Park in London, England, and a performance in Elgin, Elgin Scotland were two of the favorites. Under the direction of Dan McRae and Ben Miller, the group performed expertly after extensive rehearsals. Two performance highlight standouts were one performing for the Lord Provost of Aberdeen, Scotland, and the other before spectators in the Princess Street Gardens in Edinburgh, Scotland. In 1976, the University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders made their final European tour. For the first two weeks, they traveled the British Isles once again to large cheering crowds performing. Their tour of the continent was four weeks long and included six countries. All the travel excursions of the Scottish Highlanders left their audiences with good feelings and renewed respect for the youth of our country. On each of their European trips, when they stayed with host families in Scotland, they made lifelong friendships. 
They fostered bonds of goodwill in every country they visited, and everywhere they went, they were exceptional ambassadors and representatives of the University of Iowa, the state of Iowa, and the United States. In February 1973, in the shadow of the Equal Rights Movement, the first male since the 1940s was admitted to the ranks of the Scottish Highlanders. Tom Wiederich was the first and Steve Russell was the second. Mr. Russell said he joined the Highlanders because I just wanted to be a part of a highly respected organization. I didn't join for any liberation thing. The organization remained co-ed until the group was disbanded. In 1981, all funding support for the University of Iowa Scottish Highlanders was withdrawn by the University of Iowa. For a few years, they received supportive funds from various organizations and businesses, but financially were unable to maintain their extensive travel desires and goals. The university continued the group as a student organization under the Office of Student Life. However, their long tradition of performing at Iowa football games in Kinnick Stadium was ended. In 1986, the 50th anniversary was held with approximately 250 enthusiastic attendees. The earliest all-male years were well represented at this joyous event. Many friendships were renewed while memories were relived and tears were shed. This was a group of dedicated, passionate people who had shared a unique college experience. 2004 marked another celebration and a Scottish Highlander reunion. Again, former members from each de decade were well represented. And during the formal banquet, Bill Adamson, the oldest son of the former director, spoke of the extensive history of the group. Familiar Scottish songs were sung by the attendees who had no difficulty remembering the words to those songs. They had sung them during their memorable travels with the group. An active group of bagpipe players and drummers performed at the event. And on the following day, a more casual dinner was held and the members were invited to try to play the bagpipes again or dance the Highland Fling that they remembered. What a fun and enjoy, enjoyable experience by the young and the young at heart. At the time of the 2004 gathering, however, many, many Scottish Highlander alums had expressed concern over the apparent decline in the ranks of the group and the lack of support from the university. Dwindling membership and decreased participation moved the University of Iowa to officially disband the Scottish Highlanders in January of 2008. Scottish Highlander alums did not want their beloved organization and its importance to be forgotten. And in 2005, a small steering committee began work to attempt to preserve the impressive history of the group and their memorabilia items. Along the way, associated projects surfaced and the alums have committed to accomplish them as well. Approximately 40 old films and audio recordings produced through the years were discovered in the archives. The fragile condition of these brought attention to the fact that they need to be permanently preserved. These films were transferred to DVD format for the preservation purposes. And a sampling of each of these films was captured and reproduced in a commemorative DVD representing the 75-year history of the group. Copies of this commemorative DVD may be obtained through the University of Iowa website. We have also created a permanent display at the University of Iowa Athletics Hall of Fame. This is comprised of the historical uniforms, photos, replicas of the autographed drum heads, and other treasures. The 75th anniversary of the Scottish Highlanders 
was celebrated this past September in 2011. With the unveiling and dedication of this display, and with a reunion attended by more than 350 Scottish Highlander alumni and friends. This fabulous display honors the organization's critical part in the history of the University of Iowa, the state of Iowa, and the United States to tell their magnificent story. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I answered it all, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. There's lots of items of memorabilia and past history around the room. Please take time to take look at those items. There's also some handouts up here on the table. We'd invite you to take those as well. And thank you for coming.